This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Welcome back, everybody, to Wells Tech. This is Martin Spriggs, and you're listening or watching to episode 492, recorded on Tuesday, April 11th, 2017. So happy you joined us, and I'm so happy to have alongside, as usual, Sally Draper. How are you, Sally? I am most excellent, Martin. Happy to be joining you. Happy to be talking uh, social media and ministry today. Yeah, it's our social media ministry week. Um, We've been doing this for, I don't know, seven or eight months now, where we kind of pick one one initial day of uh, our podcast each month. And uh, we felt that social media was an important thing that we kind of go through the, maybe in a little bit more detail, um, take a particular social media slash network and plumb the depths a little bit, talk about the hot hows, the whys, the what's, the wherefores. And uh, you always put together just a beautiful (laughs) infographic, and you've done that exact thing this week too. Although it's a little bit different this week because we're not just focusing on a social network, are we? That's right, Martin. Uh, I think we may have exhausted the list of primary social <laughs> networks we've that talked in the past about, yes. um, you know, Facebook and Pinterest right up there at the top of the list. We've talked about um, Instagram and, and YouTube I, and, uh, yeah, YouTube mm-hmm. and most recently uh, Flickr and Google Photos. So lots of different channels. I'm sure there's more out there, but those are some of the more popular ones. So this month we thought we'd turn our attention to uh, kind of a how-to use social media for ministry. And one of the biggest um, observations we've made over the years and experts recommend um, is engaging what you might call ambassadors to spread your social media network. So our infographic this month, our discussion this month talks about social media ambassadors for ministry. Maybe we should start out by talking about what an ambassador is, Martin. Well, by definition, I guess the basic definition would be somebody who represents. Obviously, that's what an ambassador does. We often speak of us Christians as being Christ's ambassadors. Uh, An ambassador in the kind of the social networking sphere, at least as it relates to ministry, would be that person who has a message, normally, uh, obviously, the gospel or the message or the news from the organization, and an audience with which to share it. And I think that's kind of the, the strategy here is you're, you're trying to find people within your organization who have a sphere of influence, you know, a network of people that could be reached um, with uh, whatever message it is that you're uh, sharing with them. So there's a lot of tiers here, but essentially the, the biggest part of this is finding those people in your organization who are into social networks, right? That's right. And um, so we just kind of took some time and examined that concept and answered our key questions that we've been focusing on throughout this series, the why, the what, the who, and the how of engaging ambassadors um, in social media for ministry. And I guess starting off the discussion, a good place to start is why do this? Um, And I think our number one reason for what we do as Christians is the Great Commission, to go and tell, to share that good news of salvation through Christ Jesus. And um, we want to make use of the tools that God has given us to do that. And one of the primary communication tools in this day and age is social media. And so things like videos or Facebook posts or Instagram images or whatever it may be, um, those are comp- are um, methodologies and channels for sharing the good news. And we want to do that as best as we can. So that's a yes. great reason why. Super hard to deny, I think, at this point that social media is not a mainstream um, channel, like you said, a, a communication uh, approach that is that needs to be paid attention to and 
and to be leveraged. And I think in some respects, maybe we don't always think of it as an evangelistic um, channel, that it's more for kind of the fun stuff, pictures of vacation and um, that kind of stuff. But uh, I think in the life of a Christian, there, there aren't, nothing is off limits sharing that precious gospel, as you mentioned. So this, you know, the entire social media suite of tools at anybody's disposal becomes a way to extend the reach of a church or school's communication. If uh, the, the members are hooked into it and are maybe made aware of the opportunities, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about you know, how to do that, um, this can be a very powerful thing as they they get the word out. And, you know, one phrase that comes to mind is kind of the an equipping the saints approach that's necessary. So we've talked, we talk in our church circles about uh, uh, preparing people to share their faith. And uh, this is really no different. Uh, there's different tools, of course, but it's the same thing. Definitely. And um, social media is by and far the the place to find people these mm -hmm. days. So um, the people that you want to reach with that great message are, many of them are engaged with social media and maybe they aren't directly following or liking your church or school, but they may be friends with someone who, who is. And so right. um, it's, it's just a way to capitalize on reaching out um, where the people are located. And, yep. you know, kind of a side benefit to that is I think I, I can think of many friends who maybe are a little bit timid or shy to share their faith and giving them a platform where they're more comfortable or more engaged or are able to do it more easily may actually spark something in them that, that um, you know, moves them to do additional service and additional work in the church to use their gifts. Maybe once they have um, a taste of of ministry um, on a personal level, they might be encouraged to do it more. So. Yeah, I think you hit on a really important point, and I guess I've observed this over the last few years too. That the the organizations that really get it recognize that having an organizational Facebook page is kind of not the goal. Um, the relationship that exists between an organization and an individual is actually pretty weak. The stronger connections, the ones that uh, have some influence and the things that uh, really can make a difference are those person-to-person -person relationships. And so it's your members, it's your school parents, it's your, it's those people connected with the organization who have the connections. So the church is, is really just becomes a facilitator, an encourager, uh, a content provider. Uh, we'll talk about that too uh, in this whole equation, rather than the church or school or organization trying to build these relationships with sometimes total strangers. Definitely. So yeah, moving on into that, what, what, what do you expect these people to share? And, you know, right off the bat, we can say any of our great content that we're producing regularly, things like devotions, or maybe we make verse images, or um, we're building up a, a big event, and we have an invitation to share to that event. Perhaps it's your Holy Week services or your vacation Bible school or whatever it may be. Um, people love imagery on the um, social media channels. So if you have photo albums to share or videos or live stream, all of those things are great things that can be shared beyond your reach, um, engaging your ambassadors to, to reshare things. So yeah, hit the retweet button or whatever it may be. And, and this is something you have to encourage in them, you know, teach them to, to share your stuff further. So um, it's out there. There's a lot of great content. I'm sure you're already publishing or you should be publishing if you're doing all that work to put it together and uh, just encourage them to share what you normally are doing. Right. Yeah, that, and that's really key too. So you're not really asking a lot of people to get out of their comfort zone, but simply, you know, if they are involved in active church life, if they're doing things that uh, uh, are, are pleasing to God, that's something worth sharing as well. So it could be as simple as a check-in at church or 
uh, just a, uh, a thought on a sermon theme or uh, something that uh, you learned in Bible class or whatever it is, you know, you, maybe your personal Bible study or a prayer uh, that you wanted to share, those kinds of things all demonstrate uh, your faith, kind of that lifestyle evangelism approach. And kind of circling back to something you said, where people are engaging with other people, you know, it, it's easy to do the the blast of information just to everyone, but perhaps you want to encourage your ambassadors to pick someone specific and share with them directly and pray for them and follow up with them so that it's a more personal outreach, but yet you're providing some great content that they can share in that situation. Exactly. So we should probably talk a little bit about the who. Um, and you know, the who is kind of a, a question that may be different for every organization, but these ambassadors can take all shapes and sizes, of course. I think uh, when we talk about ambassadors in general, and I think the media experts or the social media experts would say, well, you need those influencers, those people who have a large network, large social circles. You'll get the most bang for the buck by engaging them. And that's and there's nothing wrong with that. I trying to identify those people in your organization who would have great influence. But uh, don't overlook everybody else who who is uh, on a social network. You know, that's your members, your school parents, your kids. Um, you know, there, there really is no reason to know not everyone to share and provide content that could be shared to everyone. Definitely. So um, I was thinking, you know, moms groups, maybe just to engage other mothers who are at that challenging stage with their little ones or, you know, just any kind of affinity group, people that enjoy quilting. If you have an active quilter group, then let it be known that, uh, you know, share that whatever whatever the niche may be that their interest is there and their connections are there then why not encourage them to to share right mm -hmm. speaking of sharing and you know this whole concept of garnering ambassadors and um, trying to figure out how to get content into their hands how do we do this what are some tips maybe that we would have or have been shared with us over the years that uh, could be helpful here well, one thing that popped to mind was something that we've talked about probably since day one of Wells Tech, and that was a long time ago, 492 weeks ago. I'm guessing this was somewhere in that first week or two that um, you want to have a plan, you want to have a strategy, you want to give thought to this, not do it haphazardly. And so a good place to start would be a good cross-sectional kind of communication planning committee and making social media one of their objectives as they're considering how to share the good news um, that you have to share in your congregation and school. So um, engage people. Don't just make it the one-man pastor show to, to, you know, shoulder all the responsibility of getting people to share content on social media networks, but engage people. And, and maybe some of those influencers or someone who's who's at a point in their life where um, this would fill a real gap and give them a chance to use their gifts and serve. Maybe they want to jump into this arena and, and try to, you know, organize and spearhead the efforts yep. or whatever. One thing I've usually encouraged uh, organizations to think about when they try and form this communications group uh, and the plan that they would, uh, that would come out of this is make sure you're, you're well represented. You know, it's not, uh, not your typical church council of, you know, 55 year old men that uh, get together and try and figure out how to communicate with the 16 year old. Uh, try and have a good cross section of uh, different people that uh, people groups that you're trying to reach. And uh, they don't all need to be social media experts, but I think they all need to have a passion uh, to spread the gospel. Definitely. And then once you um, have a plan and you've identified um, you know, how you're going to communicate with your ambassadors, perhaps identified some key people, but then also, um, you know, ways to engage everyone in this, this ministry effort. I think it's important to communicate, 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 because um, you have to remind people to do this. You have to help them develop the habit. You have to encourage them and thank them for their efforts. And so keep your communication channel open with this group. If it's maybe a, a weekly email or, or, you know, obviously talking to people face to face is great, but definitely nurture your group of ambassadors and encourage them regularly. Yep. 
Yeah, you know, don't let them. Uh, life gets busy, you know, and the and, uh, priorities kind of shift. But as, if you're constantly reminding them, encouraging them, certainly praying for them, uh, that's the way to go. And then, of course, not just communicate, 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 but find the content, 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 and you know, you've got to build it up. And that should not be a hard thing for a church or school. You're creating content all the time. There's always news. There's always uh, stuff that's going out that uh, could be shared. Now, you want to intentionalize it. You want to schedule it. We've talked about that in the past, too. Maybe have a content uh, calendar where you're trying mm -hmm. to earmark, you know, what goes where and what kinds of things. And you kind of see across, you know, maybe a three-month period what days you're going to do what and send what out, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you really need to think about what you have to share and what could be not just shared, but reshared and created in such a format that it's easy to do that. You know, speaking of content, Martin, as I was brainstorming about this idea, I, I had a thought that, you know, oftentimes we definitely want to share our regular content, the things we're producing. We want to get those out there. But there may be some of those personal situations like a death in the family or, or you know, different struggles or different joys. Perhaps there's some kind of a national or international event um, where someone is just looking for resources to share. And so developing a, a library, perhaps a library of verse images that you, you know, train your members that they can go there and find something for different occasions or whatever, so that they have content that's more specific to different needs and things. Now, that might be a great project for someone who's got some extra time on their hands, maybe someone who's homebound who enjoys making verse images or whatever it may be. But again, just another way of developing that content and having it um, on the ready for people to share when they need it. Right. You've seen uh, something very special up in your neck of the woods, Sally, related to this, and that's kind of a sharing event where an organization uh, challenges, I think, its constituents to to get the word out. And that was, and I don't know how many years running now, but MLC Day has been at least two, maybe three years now. Actually, yeah. we're coming up on the third MLC Day, coming okay. up on May 3rd, Wednesday, May 3rd. And um, yeah, it was just kind of a grassroots effort where we wanted to establish a day to recognize MLC, to get MLC on the lips and the thoughts and the prayers of everyone um, that is affected by the work that's done there. So um, lots of effort behind just pray, share, give, the, the threefold meaning of MLC Day and, and just engaging people to share that message. And and I could see this being kind of duplicated on a, a congregation level. Maybe you set aside a week or a month where you're just going to really put emphasis on, you know, encouraging your members to share the message of your church through social media and, and um, see what happens, see what kind of results you get, track it and share, you know, the joys and challenges, celebrate your successes, all those kind of things um, and see how it, it grows from there. I think MLC has definitely benefited from just a once a year, one day kind of emphasis on let's get excited about MLC. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's probably as much as we want to go into detail on this particular topic. A couple resources that I would suggest uh, you want to dive back into. Uh, there was an interview we did with Justin Ware, who is a social media consultant. In fact, uh, he kind of uh, was the genesis for the MLC Day concept. Um, so it might be worth reviewing that interview. Uh, that was probably three years ago now, was my was guess. In yeah, December 2014. So, yep. uh, so well worth a, a revisit to that. And maybe a little bit more recently, we devoted a chapter uh, in our book, um, With All Your Heart, talking about um, volunteering and some of these other things that uh, you know, are kind of ambassador focused, you know, getting that word out. So you may want to read that uh, chapter or reread that chapter if you already have a copy of the book. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. So All good right. stuff. Good, good stuff. And I think, Sally, I'm, you know, I'm still up in the air whether we've got another social media day in us. But uh, if, uh, if we don't, uh, I think this is probably a good one to, to close on, too. Well, 
We'll see. We'll see what May brings. Okay. Definitely. There may be a new social network we'll have to deal with. <laughs> pop up pretty quickly. Wells Tech uh, Day. How about that? Yes. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, one of the features that we have now in our quest toward episode 500 is a little bit of a retrospective. So we kind of look back in time and review uh, previous years. So in uh, year two of our journey, uh, 2009, um, was a busy year as I'm looking here at the uh, what we did way back when. Actually, if you look at the stats, 2009 was our busiest year because um, at least to date, we were um, previously just posting one podcast per week and somebody had a brainstorm that we should double up in the summertime and have a special series, bonus Wells Tech goodness, but also um, continue our regular weekly podcasting. So we actually did 60 podcasts in 2009, the most to date and uh and i'm just wondering we never did do that again we never did two in the summer it was a great experience but we learned from it and our mamas didn't raise no dummies yeah so so yeah but we uh that was a first for us to do a summer series at all the year before we hadn't done anything you know specifically different in summer but now we do make that a regular occurrence that uh, we change things up for the summer season it was also i found an interview with jason schmidt it was our our first time to meet and talk with Jason Schmidt, Mr. Sunshine. He came on the show um, back about mid-year um, 2009, and uh, he was still teaching at Gethsemane in Omaha, Nebraska. He looked like just a youngster in the picture that we had out there. So <laughs> Young buck, yes. Here we are still talking to him in 2017. And we had some best and worst at the end of the year. After a year of podcasting, we looked at our favorite things for the year. And probably the thing that stands out the most for me is the fact that I ranked a website called Learning in Hand as the worst um, of the year for me. And I didn't mean that it was a bad website. What I meant was I just hadn't really engaged and used the information that I thought I would use from that website. So I, I think it was um, it's very specifically devoted to um, devices in education so tablets and smartphones and things of that nature in education and um, the school that i was associated with back then uh, st john's and sleepy eye we just weren't quite there to to make use of that kind of technology and it wasn't you know meant to be any kind of a dish to, on them but apparently i kind of riled some people i think i found a quote that said sally was the shock jock of of wells tech <laughs> that fits me so well and uh someone who who respected tony vincent and the work he did on learning at hand said how on earth could i possibly have uh, ranked them as the worst so uh, that was a little fun story that came out of the end of 2009. yeah and it all's uh, all's well that ends well because mm -hmm. we did uh um we did connect with uh with tony and that was a good experience but yeah uh, we interviewed they had him. pitchfork and uh torches in hand <laughs> tar so and feathers yeah the there. <laughs> i don't know if we did worst picks of the year anymore after that we'll have to see if we did I them in 2010. We were pretty much uh off the boat there with uh, yeah it was pretty fans. leery <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of interesting to go back in time and see what the how these picks have turned out. I know on, you know, the ones that I picked, uh, Fox at PDF, still a thing, still a good PDF uh, alternative to the fairly expensive uh, Adobe products. Texter, which I don't think is around anymore, that's a text automation tool, uh, but there are other taken its place text expander being one and backblaze our good friend backblaze i've continued to recommend them and use them for online backup how did your picks turn out sally uh, my best were free tech for teachers still going strong richard byrne runs yeah, a, a awesome. fabulous yeah. website yeah. i think back in the day he was actually still teaching in the classroom now he's more of a consultant and right. speaker and things but great resources animoto and animoto for educators which back in the day was free to get 
accounts for all your students and do video work. Animoto is still going strong. I'm not sure that it's free at this point for educators, no, but discounted. The, the way of the dodo, yeah. Yeah. And then my number one pick was mobile Google Sync. And this is when we were just, you know, dipping our toe into yeah, mobile the is pretty new. Yeah. mobile environment and smartphones and such. So yeah, um, we made an honorable mention. Your, uh, yeah, I'm intrigued by one of your honorable mentions here. <laughs> yeah, we had a couple of honorable mentions. One was Google Chrome, and the other was uh, a sharing that I did, and I looked it up, my geek kitchen. In April of 2009, we installed an under-the-counter laptop in my kitchen, and and I have vi I have photos of the installation process. So it was basically a board with a hinge on it. We chained it up so it was at a good angle, and we mounted the laptop upside down so that we didn't have the laptop actually touching you know taking up space on the countertop but we could use a computer there we were able to flip the screen upside down and use a um, on-screen keyboard so we didn't need a keyboard for it and i ended with a picture of my son doing his homework um, staring at the screen and so um it was it was a cool project and maybe a little before its time you know now we have all kinds of devices that we can get to from anywhere but um, so did that come stuff. down when you moved i'm assuming that was in your house in sleepy eye there it did it came down it's still here it's a really ancient laptop at this point but it it was a good solution for us we used it quite a bit we'd play music we'd watch videos the kids would reference homework whatever and it's good stuff awesome it's fun to look back. So the next week we'll move up to 2010. All right. Um, we should probably move along to news in tech. Couple of news items we want to uh, share. One coming from Facebook. We maybe mentioned this uh, a couple of years ago when Facebook launched their social network for businesses. Uh, that was a fee or a, a for fee or for money uh, endeavor. And it sounds like they are going to be making that available for free coming up. So if that's intriguing to you, maybe you want to check that out. Right. The article that will include a, show, a link to in the show notes is, says that it's called Workplace. And it's going to be called Workplace Standard, and the paid version will be renamed Workplace Premium. Premium right. The current offering is priced at $3 per user per month for the first 1,000 users for the premium. But, you know, so many people are in this space now providing the, the running chat and file sharing and all the things connected. I'm thinking Slack um, is a big contributor in that area and very popular with many businesses. Um, lots of other ways to do it as well. And Facebook definitely owns the personal communication um, to a large extent. So I could see them making more headway with their business offerings. Yep. Um, second item, uh, real briefly, I don't have any experience with this, but I, Apple launched a new or will launch, uh, I think it is out, a new social video creation app, kind of their own Snapchat, Instagram mm -hmm. stories kind of offering called Clips. Now available, of course, only on their devices, iPhone and iPad. Uh, have you tried this, Sally? I have not. No. Nope. So if any of our seeing... out there have, I'd love to hear any feedback that uh, you have and if this is going to catch on. It might be interesting. It looked pretty cool, the demo that I saw. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's and Apple has a little bit of an advantage because they have total control over the ecosystem and the hardware that it's running mm -hmm. on. So it may be a, a win for them. We'll see. Yeah, I'm seeing more of those kind of features being added regularly to Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. That's what my family uses for a lot of that kind of communication. And so now you can regularly see, you know, overlays for your images and videos and things like that. I think that's a big Snapchat thing where you can put your messenger put hats on and message, your messages on Messenger are permanent, right? Um, they are. Yeah, so that would be a difference. And Instagram, okay. which is owned by Facebook. Um, their stories feature, they are ephemeral. They they last a day, I think, or okay. they roll off at some point. And mm -hmm. I think uh, Clips is a little bit different than that. And Snapchat, of course, the same way. Clips is a little bit different because I think it, it it kind of features more the the creation of that. So you're creating this stuff. You're creating these movies or whatever. And then you use, I think, some of these traditional channels to, to send it out. So okay. it'll be interesting to see how it goes. 
Interesting. We have anything in Wells now this week, Sally? Yeah, a couple of things to mention, or mainly one thing to mention there, and that's the fact that we have a Shop Wells program. And um, Shop Wells exists to basically do group purchasing agreements. Um, so you can save money by being a member of the Wells, by being a church or a school in the Wells. And so there's lots of flavors to it, but many of the offerings are available for personal use for Wells members. And one that you might want to take advantage of specifically is uh, discounts at choice hotels. Vacation season is rapidly approaching and maybe you're traveling or are considering um, you know, a vacation. And right now they actually have a, a deal that if you, um, you can get a free night, I think if you stay two nights before April 27th. Two nights will get you one before April 27th. So it's not going to help you on your summer vacation, but if you do have travel plans uh, in the short term, it may be a wise thing to look at choice hotels. So that's a comfort suite, uh, sleep in, you know, that uh, that whole chain of, of hotels. And that's just one example of a partner that we have in the Shopwells program. If you're interested in learning more, a great way to do that is to subscribe to the Shopwells newsletter. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. But that way you can, uh, uh, we send out something every couple weeks. It's a short blurb. Uh, it's not going to overwhelm your inbox, but it does uh, give you an idea of some of these specials or features a vendor or, or whatever. So why not head on over and uh, subscribe? Plus, once you're in the, that subscribe page, all kinds of other stuff from the Synod that might be interesting to you. Mission blogs and uh together newsletter and devotions and so on and so forth. So take advantage of that. You took the words right out of my mouth, Martin. That is like one of my favorite things to do is to get Wells email and learn about what's going on in different areas of Wells. So sign up for all that great email and you'll be in the know. Yep. Sally, we're going to move on to our tips and picks of the week. And looky there, you've got uh, a retro pick. Just couldn't resist doing a shout out to our good friend, Tony Vincent, from the Learning in Hand uh, website. Stood the test of time and he's still out there giving great advice about um, digital devices in the classroom. Uh, what I found on Tony's website that I thought was really interesting was a page called Gear where he talks about all different types of uh, hardware, um, different gadgets and things that he makes use of um, as a speaker or in the classroom or whatever it may be. And I uh, found some really great tips here. There's things, you know, he's got a drone listed that he uses for, for flying videos. He listed a label maker because he, um, Maybe he has regular handouts, but he'll just customize them with a label and a QR code on it for a specific audience. Um, he's got live event cameras. Oh, and he listed an iRig microphone. That was one that resonated with me. I happen to have an iRig microphone. I'm holding it up in front of the camera and it's not showing because I'm sharing my desktop. There's my iRig microphone. So you can use a really high quality microphone with your, um, your smartphone, your tablet, whatever it is. iRig's been around for quite a while and has really great products. Further down the page, he mentions another microphone. It happens to be the one I'm speaking into. Let's see if I can find a picture of it on my screen, which I'm no longer sharing. It's the Yeti Blue microphone, and that's what um, I use for podcasting. Martin, I'm not sure if you're still using a Yeti Blue or not. I turned mine over to Mike Hintz, who does the uh, recording for the Daily Devotions, because I had a couple that I was using, so I'm using, what am I using here? You're probably hearing all kinds of microphone noise here now. Audio uh, ATR 2100. Uh, okay. This a recommendation from a podcaster that I listen to. It's kind of nice. I don't think I've ever made this a pick, but it's smaller, but it's still USB, and it also has a XLR mm -hmm. connection, so you could hook it up to uh, uh, a soundboard. To huh? a, yeah, to a regular sound system and a soundboard. Sure. So. sure. So yeah, there's the Yeti Blue mic. I scrolled past really quickly. All kinds of lighting things, background things. Here's a grid it organizer. Got to stop Yay, sharing my screen grid. again. I've got, one I've of those. got a, a grid it organizer myself in lovely blue, and this goes everywhere I go. It's it's a great way to just quickly tuck in all those different cables and your mouse and your anything that you need to pack in your bag with that's 
kind of difficult to handle, you can tuck it in your grid it and uh, easily take it along with you. So uh, great picks from Tony. I, I'm anxious now to go shopping. He's got um, document camera ideas. He's got, um, a, what's it called? Shucks, I scrolled past it. One of those things that stabilizes your image. You know, if you've got a camera and I'm not seeing Gimbal. it. Gimbal, that's what it's called. I knew you'd know. He's got one of those for your um, your phone so that you can take really smooth video mm -hmm. using your, your phone. Um, all kinds of great ideas here from Tony. And uh, I would guess he puts these tools to the test being um, out there on the speaking circuit and very engaged with a lot of people. Um, his recommendations mean a lot. So check out the gear page from Learning in Hand. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, I am excited about my pick because this is something that uh, I think a lot of people have been asking for for a long, long time, and that is the ability to use um, team-based Google Drive folders. And Google recently launched something called Team Drives, and that's exactly what they are. They are folders that don't have to be assigned to any one person, but can be owned by groups of people. So one of the biggest challenges, I, I think, for a long time is this concept that if you have a Google Drive, somebody, one individual has to own every file. Now, you can share it, uh, mm -hmm. but you can't have this concept of a team drive. So that's what Google has, has launched. I'm showing those of you that are watching, I'm showing what it looks like if I'm logged in as just a regular old Google user. Uh, so that's a neat part about this tool is that you can share it with whoever you want. If the uh, if the G Suite customer, the school or the church or whatever allows that, you can share outside of your organization, which is a big win. If you're inside the organization, and this happens to be our Peace Lutheran Church and School site, uh, you can uh, you have a little bit different view, but there are all kinds of things that you can do. You can manage members, add members. You can apply themes. Um, you can uh, do subfolders, and obviously sharing is is a, a great piece of this. But uh, you can expand the team as large as you want or as small as you want, and it acts just like um, a Google Drive, a regular My Drive kind of thing, with one exception. Well, two exceptions. I already mentioned the first one that you can have a team. The second is kind of a negative right now, and that's you can't sync it. So you can't have a local copy of this, which is kind of a bummer, and I hope they fix that. Uh, there is one other negative that it's only available right now to uh, schools who have those school accounts, education accounts, the G Suite education accounts, and work accounts. So the paid for account. Uh, so it's not available, I don't think, for nonprofits. And it's not available for just Joe users uh, who aren't in a G Suite kind of environment. But I know a lot of our listeners are schools and have those school accounts. So this is, uh, I think, a big win um, for for them because it really is a lot easier to understand. I know when I've worked with our church faculty, our school faculty, that's really one challenge that somebody's, you can't have this community drive or couldn't have this community drive with just shared files uh, that anybody could access that you wanted to without kind of understanding this. Well, Cindy's the owner and she's got to share it with Joe and Jim and Sally. Um, just is it's a bummer. So team drive is just a, a godsend if, if that's kind of your, that's the situation you're in. So I'm excited. Yeah, that is very cool. I'm wondering, and maybe you answered this question and I just did, no, I didn't infer it or whatever, but um, about storage. So when I work with my files, and I guess if I'm at Google for Education School, it's unlimited storage anyway. I believe but, it's unlimited, yes. So that's probably the answer to that question. Yep. So that, do you think this will ever roll out to personal? I would, I think they've got to. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know why they wouldn't. It's a, I don't think that it's costing them anything. Mm -hmm. uh, personal, you know, is probably not as great a use case, but I think, you know, there is some. Mm -hmm. I think the nonprofit 
piece. I think a lot of our churches use that nonprofit one mm -hmm. that I think this would help them too. So I can't imagine why they wouldn't. It's that. just usually the owner is the one that's burdened with the, yeah, the, the storage, you know, and right. if you, if you do have a limit, you know, are you going to put yep. that storage on everyone or whatever? It's going to be attached. Yeah. And that's maybe that's why it's attached to G suite account itself. So, uh -huh. I don't know. Mm -hmm. we'll see. Okay. Um, but things pick. like this are coming, which is great. It, it, it becomes a lot more like, um, uh, SharePoint, which is what we use at the Synod level where you can have a library document, mm -hmm. library, or whatever that is, you know, community owned. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit more comfortable. Very Sally, good. we should probably move on to our ministry resources. I can hardly wait. I think you're up this week. <laughs> that's that why you can hardly wait. That's, that's exactly why. Because <laughs> um, you're going to be up next week, and next week oh. will come sooner than you think. <laughs> uh, uh, just a reminder that uh, all in, all 2017 long, we are putting an emphasis on providing good, solid ministry resources. Not that they weren't good and solid in the past, <laughs> but we're trying to kind of amp this up and share this and and uh, do some do some cool things with this. And um, I went back in the archives and found a blog post that I've reread a number of times since, and I felt it was probably worth sharing as a as a bona fide ministry resource. And that's a blog post by um, Rick Warren. A lot of you are familiar with Rick Warren as the author of uh, Purpose Driven Life. Now, we don't necessarily agree with all of the theology, but this is not a theological blog post I'm referencing. It is about productivity. He calls it 17 Tips for Staying Productive. And I picked out uh, just five that I found particularly beneficial, although I think all 17 are, are right on. Um, and these are... Um, you know, a lot of them are just common sense, but uh, it's good to kind of remind yourself of some common sense approaches to productivity. One of them kind of harkens back to last week when we talked about bullet journals. Put your plans on paper. And I think I would put air quotes around paper. It could be something <laughs> digital, too. Of course uh, you would. <laughs> write out what you want to accomplish. Spell it out. Um, just make sure you're intentional about it so that it is codified it's something it's helpful to kind of type it out write it out whatever get it down so that you can reread it number two remind yourself of the benefits of completing the job uh warren says jesus did this the bible says in hebrews that jesus endured the cross because he looked to the joy beyond it he looked beyond the cross and saw the result of it i think that's great advice number three do a small part of it right now so in other words get started do a small part uh, don't stall take it Take it a bite at a time and give it give it five minutes. So you've got a kind of a stake in the ground. I think that's excellent advice. Know your energy patterns and take advantage of peak times. And we've talked about that. That's a tenet of uh, get the getting things done methodology as well. Uh, don't try and start uh, real complicated things when your energy is low or or kind of miss out on those peak times by doing just kind of the sundry mindless things. Um, so be smart about your energy patterns. And number five, enlist a partner. If you've got a big task and it's up to you, you're probably, you will probably procrastinate. But if you've got somebody else and can say, we're going to meet and get this thing going, you're more likely to get it done. And we kind of do that in our team work, Sally, uh, with our, with our coworkers. We have, uh, uh, morning meetings. So there can be just five mm -hmm. minutes long, but it's kind of a, what did we do? What needs getting done? What's standing in our way kinds of things. And I think it's, uh, you know, these are good, uh, good pieces of advice. I did have a related resources section and uh, I called back to, uh, you know, the productivity resources we have talked about in the past on the podcast, but, uh, one of them was just last week, the bullet journal. Now I can't say that I've done that I have a bullet journal yet, but I'm thinking about some of the concepts. Uh, so that was a that was a good tip and a good week last week. And then just the whole uh, book by Matt Perman that we did a review of um, mm -hmm. not too long ago, last year, two years ago. Um, What's best next? How the gospel transforms the way you get things done. So all good places to start in your productivity journey. So that's the ministry resource for the week. Excellent. Always excited to to 
rejuvenate productivity, there's always room for improvement and, you know, kind of taking a fresh look at things. So it's good important. Tips. We call it stewardship in Christian circles and God asks mm -hmm. us to be good stewards of everything he's given us, including time. We have a featured video this week and that is that is he stood before the court it's um, from our friends at koine and we thought with this being holy week this would be a great reminder for us of uh, what jesus accomplished for us this week so check it out and uh, stay tuned because sunday's coming so Sunday's coming yes i'm excited about la uh, next week already sally because it's community feedback week and there was a special piece of feedback from one of our favorite contributors, Rob Gunther. It involves, I'll just say it involves a journal. It involves paper, secret pens, and a microwave. <laughs> Uber geekery. I can't wait. That right. should be All fun. Right. So we'll see what Rob has in store for us. Thanks for yeah. sharing, Rob. So that's it for this week. Thank you all for joining us this Holy Week. Blessings on your, your journey to the cross and the empty tomb. Uh, this weekend. And uh, we will see you on the other side. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.